Good uh, evening, everybody. We're ready to start the session. Um, don't trust certainty. So, um, as some of you, do you know BuzzFeed? Who knows BuzzFeed or Mashable? It's always about telling everybody what something is in three words. Um, and, and making things that are sometimes more complicated uh, very simple. So uh, recently, I don't know if you've seen John Oliver's uh, piece on scientific studies. It was telling when, uh, when researchers published a study done on pregnant women. And one of the things they were testing to see if chocolate had an impact on, on the health. And it was not. But the media loved that there was chocolate and pregnant women in there. So they made this beautiful headline in the newspaper, chocolate will improve pregnancy. You should eat at least three quarters of a, uh, of a chocolate. Well, you get the point that things are not as easy as they seem sometimes, not as simple. We're sometimes a bit in it impatient. And our next speaker has a very interesting uh, background. Like when she, was, uh, when she was a little kid, she was coding, making websites. And then later she moved into more writing, anthropology. And right now she combines both those fields where uh, she looks into big data, uh, uh, biotechnologies, and, um, and ethics that come together when humans are at play with technologies. She's consulted for the BBC, for the UK Ethics Committee, and I think she has a, a, not a, a beautiful explanation of a complex uh, problem, if I'm correct. Please welcome on stage Lydia. Uh, hi, it's lovely to see you. Uh, yeah, so basically I'm an anthropologist who studies data and information, and uh, I've got a challenge that I think will be particularly relevant to a lot of you. I know that a big part of the audience here is technical and scientific students. And I think that a lot of the issues that I'm going to touch on are things that will be really interesting to hear your kind of perspectives on. So I look forward to talking to you about it all at the end. Uh, as, uh, as you've heard, I'm an anthropologist and I work mostly around information and data. And people can often think that those two are quite separate things. You have kind of people with their bad jokes and their broken hearts and their stories over here. And then you've got pure numbers, you've got data, you've got information right up here. But the more you look at it, the more you realize that all of that stuff up here is actually social. It's all very human stories. Every beep, every algorithm, every number in a spreadsheet, they're all very human, they're all part of our social world, and they carry with them a lot of biases and gaps and assumptions. So in order to study that, I tend to uh, follow information as it moves through different forms as uh, it travels uh, in the scientific and medical community from lovely wet Petri dishes like this uh, through whispered conversations in scientific institutions, corridors, into readings and scanners, uh, into published journal articles, into contracts between, science, uh, between universities and pharmaceutical companies, into uh, tests and tests and tests, and then into a doctor's office where they hand you a pill to deal with whatever problem that you're coming to them with today. Uh, so I want to talk to you about the places where information as it moves through that journey gets stuck as it doesn't maybe get from one stage into the other as easily as you might think. How some information gets left behind right at the beginning and some doesn't even get produced at all. And I want to explain how the information that we get out at the end of the process, whilst it might be correct, no one has lied, it in fact isn't the entire story. And the fact that we're seeing that part, it can warp our entire understanding of the world in very profound ways. Because other equally true information didn't make it through. Uh, that information might have been too strange, too complicated to understand. Uh, maybe no one thought it was important. Maybe it was too difficult to sell or to use. And so it gets dismissed as an error. It gets lost in the laboratory. It gets overlooked. And we face a lot of pressure, and particularly as science students, you'll face a lot of pressure to create explanations that make, uh, that make a really simple sense. If I do this, then this happens. Always, always, and very simplistically. And as we try and as we make decisions like that, we gradually build institutions, a whole lot of institutions like academia, the research industries, the education system, and those create in turn 
uh, more and more barriers for different kinds of information to get through. Uh, a really simple example uh, is uh, the exams that we do. We, we know that this kind of thing, a multiple choice quiz, uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, the results from it, the data, can be, uh, can be averaged and compared at the scale of an individual classroom, uh, at a city, of a region. It can be compared over time, over uh, large geographies. But we also know that it doesn't capture all the other information about kids studying. We know it doesn't capture that they can write poetry, that they can handle stress well, that they can teach other kids complex stories. We know all of that, but that quiz is so cheap and so powerful. The information that it produces flows up into databases and charts, systems of analysis. So really, our entire education system acts as if that is the whole reality. It's used to decide funding. Uh, it's used to decide kids' futures. And so because children and teachers are rational people, they invest in creating the kind of, in studying for the kinds of information that that system can use. They alter their behavior to fit the narrow perspective that we've got on them. What is real becomes that thing that we've already defined through our bias system is important. And uh, this translates into health. There are a thousand apps out there that are all competing to measure my steps. And that isn't because steps are a very good indicator of health. Uh, they don't tell me much about really how fit I am or how happy I am, but they're really easy to make. Like a step counting app is pretty easy to knock out. So I get that app and I take more steps, uh, but I don't get any more polite or any more grateful. I don't build any more of those trusting, deep social relationships that we know are far more correlated with a long and a healthy life than any kind of exercises. So right now, I think we stand obviously at the dawn of an information age. The amount of information being produced about us is cr increasing exponentially. Uh, and obviously, in order to handle that massive data, we have to create systems, algorithms, decision support tools, which help us use all of that uh, and see patterns within it and build and, and make decisions. Uh, so there's a great challenge and an opportunity now to think about what we're capturing and what we might be missing, what we're throwing away, what kinds of values we're encoding into these systems that will teach our kids, that will decide what we invest in, the things that will build our future. Because we are at risk of reproducing biases and blind spots and altering and creating a world that doesn't perhaps serve the best interests of us or the truth. So, uh, in order to look at this particular problem, uh, I went to a synthetic biology pro project. Uh, this is a nice quote about it. So, synthetic biology, I think probably most of you know, it's about the design and construction of biological parts that you then plug in together to make something that, uh, an industrializable or a usable thing. So, in the simplest terms, uh, you take, say, the glowy pink gene out of a jellyfish, uh, the, de the gene for detecting a pathogen out of a bacteria, you plug them together and boom, you can create, if you're lucky, a bandage that will glow when that wound gets infected. Uh, so the team that I worked with, they were trying to create uh, living materials that would coat medical equipment and glow in different colors if there were infections. But as well as creating those organisms, they were also trying to create a, um, a system, a computer system, that would predict how different genes would work together, uh, which would help people in the future do more efficient experiments. So they would know that if you put this gene and this gene together, it definitely won't work, your bacteria will die, don't bother. If you put this gene and this gene in a different way, it might work, so it's worth doing that experiment. And uh, the nice thing about that for me is that, uh, in fact, the thing behind this, the red and green stuff, is uh, it's a super cool experiment. They're bacteria that they're trying to coax into making stripes and swirls to kind of be able to visualize how they can show that bacteria are communicating with each other. So the stuff that they're making is just amazing. But the fact that 
in this team, they were also trying to create a system. It meant that you had a whole mess of different people. And synthetic biology is already, like, it's a young field. It's great for an anthropologist, because when you ask people questions, they can't say, well, it's just because this is the way we've always done it, because this is the way we've always done it is only like a year or two. These departments are often very young. Uh, so it meant that I got to talk to the biologists that work in the lab, the bioinformaticians who work with a ton of data, the complex systems modelers, all sorts of computer scientists, including people whose job it is quite literally to like encode and write DNA and write the systems that do that, which is just amazing. I love that that is an actual job description. Uh, and the thing about that interdisciplinary project, I don't know if any of you have done that many interdisciplinary, uh, these kind of large projects, but at the end of a biology uh, project or a computer science project, if you're lucky, uh, what you end up with is something that is pretty much equally true. You get a peer-reviewed scientific journal paper. So that's accepted by most people in the scientific community as being pretty much on an equal level. Uh, but the problem is that before that, at the point where in this project people were trying to work together, you get a lot of confusion and a lot of mess, a lot of clashes between people with very different cultures, very different uh, kind of trainings and habits. Uh, when, and there's a lot of arguments. But the thing is, these were arguments that the computer scientists always won. And why was that? Well, this guy boasted that you could replicate his results on, on a couple of lines of code and a paragraph of explanation. When you dig into it, it's not always that true because you also had to configure the system to do all of the data churning. But really, the reason that his work was so e much more easily digestible by the university administrators was that the kind of information he produced was much easier for them to use. Uh, it was much easier to move through that system of turning it from uh, work on his screen into a journal paper into something that could be spread through multiple systems, could be reused and resold. And that kind of thing, it was easily understandable to the administrators. Uh, and the way that the computer scientists work, I mean, you know, I've been a programmer. You sit there and you run your script a thousand times. You're debugging, you're running it. If it works the first time, you know that something's wrong. Then you're continually checking and checking and checking, comparing, tweaking variables, uh, trying to get that end result closer and closer and closer to the result that you're wanting. And that meant that they were all able to fill their schedules, their wikis, their updates for how they were doing and how they were progressing really easy, really predictably, really clearly. Whereas the biologists, they had a lot further to travel until they produced something that the project administrators thought was worth anything. Uh, they start off a lot further away from clean numbers. Uh, so, you know, this is the kind of work where you're staying up overnight, coaxing these things to grow, to stay alive. Um, and you have to dilute, for, to get this kind of result, uh, you have to dilute these mixtures exactly the right amount so that they're in the exact range that the resurazin, I could never pronounce it, the resurin array, it shows you the exact right scale of purple and blue. And then you have to make judgment calls to make sure that it's exactly there. You're, the whole time you're fighting with other students for the equipment so they'll change your settings overnight. And a lot of the time, they don't know why something hasn't worked. They told me a story about how one project was working absolutely fine for months and months and months, and then suddenly it stopped. And they took so long trying to work out what had changed, what they were doing wrong, why was this replication not working? And it was only after weeks and weeks and weeks and bringing in senior people and cracking their heads they realized that the administrator had switched the agar supply, that's the food for the bacteria, to a cheaper supplier, to a different, uh, a different set. And it was supposed to be pretty much chemically identical. But for some reason, the bacteria was just like, nope, I don't like this, I want my old food. They never had any explanation of why that didn't work. So for the, the, for the biologists, there's a problem of the fact that you don't gradually get closer and closer and closer to a better answer. You have to run that, that experiment about 10 times for you to work out that you've even got that first result. And then they end up with these huge arguments. 
uh, like this one. This is my favorite. Uh, so this was shouted across a room where the computer scientists were saying, why haven't you updated your project wiki with what percentage completeness you are like, so, that you can send us, so that you can send us the results? They were saying, why can't you send us the interim findings of the individual trial like, replications rather than only sending us the final one? And the, compute and the, back the biologists were desperately trying to explain, it's not that we're improving a sum, it's that every time we have to check. And this, this halfway through an experiment, this isn't, getting nearer to an answer. This is not 50% of true. It's nothing at all. It doesn't count. And they're trying to explain that the organisms, they're not like sums that you gradually improve. There's a lot of unpredictability there. There's quirks. There's these fluctuations. And of all the people that I interviewed over these two years, a lot of them are very, very willing to tell you that they have a hierarchy of sciences. Uh, this is from a complex systems researcher, and he was quite open that he liked the purer sciences more. He'd say, there's physics, there's chemistry, and then there's biology. Because biologists can't give you answers, they only give you stories. Uh, they have vastly more environmental factors, uh, and vastly more bothersome human skill. Like the very skill of actually putting uh, substances together and keeping these things alive is something that they don't want to admit is a very technical skill. But the problem is that despite this appearance, being easier to quantify, being easier to explain to someone doesn't make something more true. Uh, so one biologist, uh, PhD, PhD student that I interviewed, uh, just interrupted me while I was explaining what I did and said, uh, you do realize that none of this is real, don't you? None of this is real. And he explained that the bacteria that were in the lab that he was researching, they'd quite naturally responded to the evolutionary pressures of that lab, right? The, the E. coli have been living, living in these laboratories for so long that they've lost any sense of the real world. We take care of them in, uh, in return for them being really easy to use. The bacteria that evolved slower, that gave you nicer, cleaner answers, they get used over and over again. They get to breed, so we keep them. And he told me that these were, these were called wild-type E. coli because they'd never been deliberately engineered, but in fact, they were very, very different from anything that you would find in the soil or in someone that's sick. Because real wild E. coli, he told me, are far too unpredictable. They, under, they undergo evolution too fast. So what was explained through all of these, these interviews was that the pressure that the scientists felt uh, to produce more clear and certain looking results uh, from their funders, from their supervisors, from peer reviewers, all of whom mean very well and they want to produce good science, they exert so much pressure on the world that they actually change the world. You end up studying this bacteria that is not giving you a good portrait of what you were trying to study in the first place. It's not that any of these results were not true, that anyone was lazy, but the whole system of academia and of truth production uh, was biased and blinkered. And that bias had become so powerful that like that classroom test we were talking about, it had changed reality itself. Because we know that life is unstable. It's interconnected. It has a lot of randomness, a lot of stochasticity. Sometimes bacteria will just hibernate. Sometimes they misread a signal from a nearby cell and they react weirdly in response. Sometimes they accidentally replicate a protein or a sequence of DNA wrong, and it will mess up your experiment. But that's evolution, right? That is why a, these, these cells have managed to produce these wonderful and elegant solutions to problems like glowing pink or detecting pathogens. That's the most powerful, robust feature of life and why we're studying them at all. So in our attempts to get stable measurements, uh, we've pr uh, missed or distorted the most valuable property of life itself. So why is this a uh, problem when we put these pressures on scientists? Uh, because it sounds like I'm saying that we shouldn't simplify anything. But in fact, it's about when these things go too far, they produce very dangerous results. So uh, in 2006, in a London hospital, uh, a drug for leukemia that had been tested uh, on many, many mice, rabbits, and monkeys uh, was tested on 14 volunteers. 
out of one five hundredth of the dose that had been given to these animals. Just one five hundredth of this dose had been tested on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals. And yet that first introduction of the compound, all of the volunteers underwent immediate catastrophic systemic organ, uh, systemic organ failure. Uh, one man, they were all rushed to intensive care. One man lost all of his fingers and toes. Another one was developing cancer within months. All of them had their immune systems completely destroyed and will never really recover. But this had worked on all of these animals. These like everything in the system seemed to have worked. Why did this happen? Well, there was a lot of discussion for, for many, many years. Uh, but uh, eventually, the general scientific uh, con uh, well, this is the answer, but I can skip to the interview with the lead researcher, which is the broadly accepted view is that these human volunteers, their immune systems, the learning T cells, that element of our immune system that manages to, you know, if you get a vaccine or you get an illness once, you don't get it again. They developed over an entire messy lifetime. They'd interact with, all, with every childhood infection, every winter cold, every change in gut flora. Whereas the animals that served as test subjects, they grew up in sterile laboratories, uh, in white clean boxes that were designed to be as near to a spreadsheet cell as possible, so that the information could move out of their bodies and into the database that would move into the, into the study and the trial. But because of that, because of that design of trying to reduce as many variables as possible, it meant that they failed their success in the system meant that they failed to produce treatments that could actually be used by humans. Uh, this fit to, re to the system uh, did not indicate any kind of fitness to reality. Uh, it's very cute. So, um, yeah, if you, th there is obviously a tension here. There's a problem. All of these mice, they're identical twins and people are not. If you tested them in field mice, you would be fine, but that would take forever. Uh, another thing that all of these laboratory mice are is male. Uh, all laboratory mice that get tested on are male. Uh, the, the, the reason given for this is that um, tiny mousy menstrual cycles are very, very fast, so there could be changes introduced, fluctuations. Uh, that might be acceptable. It shouldn't be that relevant to too many uh, to too many studies, and we also we change the temperature in different laboratories without indicating that. But uh, this carries through into human trials, which is the bigger problem. Uh, so women of childbearing age, which is most women, uh, were banned from participating in clinical trials in the US until the mid-1990s. Uh, so all drugs that were developed uh, before then were tested exclusively on men. And although there have been efforts uh, to make up that difference since, still about 70% of clinical trial participants are male, and 83% of them are white. And this doesn't mean that the information produced from these male clinical subjects is wrong, uh, but it's that the information about all the other people what didn't seem to be worth making. It was too complicated. It, it had too, much, too many extraneous factors. Uh, so that means that there is a lot less information about drug effects on women. Uh, and unsurprisingly, some recent studies, the FDA has realized that this is a huge problem, so they're taking a lead on trying to fix this. They've realized that women report 50 to 75% more uh, side effects from many drugs. Uh, a couple of drugs have been tested again since. Uh, so in 2014, they found that Ambien, which is an insomnia drug with some terrible side effects if you take too much, uh, that women actually require half of the dose that men do. So for the decades that Ambien was being used before, like tens of thousands of women were systemically overdosing and suffering from these terrible side effects. And you might think this is just a social justice issue, but some of these things, they're also, it's also a market issue. Eight out of 10 of the drugs that are recalled in the US is because they have uh, more side effects on women that haven't been spotted in the trial period. So this, this idea of trying to simplify your original story ends up creating things that are not just necessarily simpler, but a lot of the time they don't work the way that we want to. The idea of a default body, the, the mouse that's grown up in a laboratory, uh, the white male body that is held to stand in for all kinds of other bodies, those are real things, but they don't tell the whole story. Uh, 
Now, the problem with this, no one is saying that we don't want cures, that we don't want the benefits of science. Uh, but it's becoming increasingly obvious that we need to fix some stuff about this distorted picture. So in uh, October of 2015, uh, Nature, the journal, fortunately I'm not the only one worried about this, uh, Nature published an entire issue on the crisis of reproducibility. Uh, and they, they set out the idea that um, there was a huge problem in the fact that the academic system is pressurizing scientists to produce certain types of results that look good, that give certain answers in order to be published. But, and this is a quote from Nature, these may actually be distortions. So the idea is that scientists, uh, they experience so much pressure. Like a lot of the time your career is riding on these results and there's unconscious bias at every stage in gathering data, in cleaning data, in the tweaking of inputs and algorithms to try and produce a cleaner, more simple story. So Nature, in order to uh, talk about this, they did this. Uh, it's a wonderful case study where they got uh, 29 research teams to try and look at the same problem. Uh, so it was about whether uh, dark-skinned football players get more red cards than their lighter-skinned other players. Uh, and as you can see, those are, those are a pretty wide range of results. And this is a really contentious issue. So they were all working on the same data with the same question. Any one of those results uh, could be a headline, at least in the UK, or like a hugely contentious starting of, de of a debate. But it turns out that not one of them tells the whole story. Uh, they were trying to use this as an example of why uh, so a lot of these leading headlines, even when the methodologies seem to be perfectly correct, a lot of the time can introduce distortions just because of the pressure put on those working on it in order to produce a certain kind of story. So uh, a lot of the kinds of changes that Nature are proposing, because they recognize that this is a huge challenge, uh, is that um, we redesign uh, research methods so that you end up with multiple teams working on the same question at the same time. They want to change the institutional culture so that you can talk to each other and improve on one another's methods, work together more. Uh, and they, you know, they are highlighting a lot of techniques that allow you to blind scientists to their results at the data cleaning and capture stage. Uh, but all of this is really about changing one part of the system, about introducing some quick fixes. Uh, but this is recognized as a crisis. Um, this is something that pretty much all of the people here, if they're going into the sciences, will encounter this kind of pressure to tell a simple story that you often might find, and a lot of the time it's unconscious, right? But there's a pressure that we need to work out how to fight against. Uh, we need to change at a cultural level to recognize the fact that every simple number that you get is actually the result of a hundred qualitative decisions. Everything about what you value, what you've decided, where you've decided to put your senses, what you think is important. Um, so this is a challenge, right? Uh, how can we move forward? How can we think about these issues? How can we handle uncertainty? Um, and this is a problem that I think we're all going to face. And I really welcome any kind of input and thoughts on the matter. Uh, thank you. It's really nice to see uh, at the end all the headlines. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what the media is always looking for. Yeah. Just three words. Yeah. Uh, drinking coffee makes you live a hundred times longer. Yeah. Um, so let's take, if I have a, a handheld, then we can take some questions from the room. So are there any yeah. questions? We have one there. Thank you. Yeah. What is your best um, way to move forward? What are your um, <laughs> ideas about it? Uh, so I, I found that the scientists that I worked with, a lot of, there was a huge value in, uh, sorry, I'm going to get my water. Um, there was a huge value in getting people of different disciplines to work together and to tell each other the stories of their work so that they began to understand the, you know, your work isn't a rubbish version of mine. In fact, there are, there are much more, there's much more that's being hidden 
But the problem is that that only works between departments and it only works on a small scale. Um, I mean, I, I get academics sometimes to write short stories and to work with artists to try and get them to think about uh, new, about the different ways that we could be relating to scientific in knowledge. Because like the media angle is a big issue. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, the newspaper headline, but this is also a problem within scientific institutions and I, in, in these systems in a bigger way. So it's, uh, it's got, like, there's yeah. a lot of part that has to do with incentive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as, a, as an academic, you have to yeah. meet certain standards. Yeah, you have to, but so one of the issues is that you're producing a set one set of standards and, but that's, you're forcing people to work towards one sort of goal Whereas, in fact, there are lots of other ways that they could be producing quality research. They could, be, like, the fact that we should be publishing more negative results is an obvious one. I, and people should be able to talk about each other's methods more. They're, they're also, I mean, there is a huge problem in biology about uh, people writing up their methods not talking about the practical skills involved, about not recognizing that there is a real skill involved in operating a particular machine. And so when people try to replicate it, they can't produce the same results. So yeah. there needs to be more of a recognition of the different kinds of skills that go in. Yeah. Um, so there was better a beautiful, work on methods. Uh, a beautiful saying about replication. Yeah. Uh, there is no honor whatsoever of replicating a study. Mm. And as a result, less than, I don't know, uh, yeah. less than a percent of all studies are, are validated. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the problems there is that in order for science to move fast, you need people to keep discovering new things. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't have a full solution. I think people need to be more upfront about their methods and about their uncertainties. Um, but that's, that's roughly where I am with it. Yeah. More questions? Another follow-up question. But there is uh, the peer review process. Is that not working, or yeah, is, is the peer review process not working? Well, yeah, that's what a lot of the scientists I spoke to said. They said that you that papers get accepted with very weak methods uh, or descriptions of what they're doing, and that people don't talk about like the person that told me that the ever the E. coli had evolved was a PhD student. So he didn't have, he wasn't fully invested in the structure, but as soon as I asked other people about it, they said, yeah, but we never talk about it. So they're like, they're all doing peer review of each other's work and they're all ignoring this key fact that the stuff that they're studying, I, doesn't actually reflect reality. Um, and this is not the, I, I think a lot of the time they realize this, but your next career goal is a lot of the time more important than like dealing with this big unspoken project because people are under so much pressure. Um, yeah, I spoke to people that edited journals and that would admit, you know, after a couple of drinks that this was a massive, massive problem. And nature has like a whole series of different ideas of how to deal with it. And they're trying to uh, support people in creating tools that can help you sort of, the, the thing about blinding yourself to the results of your data is really powerful for certain kinds of experiments where you have a lot of data and you can run that tool. So maybe investing more in tools that allow people to investigate. But yeah. yeah. There was a really cool saying, there's no, bell, there's no Nobel Prize mm. for peer reviewing yeah. a paper. Only the person that is making the paper gets all the credit. Yeah. Anyone else? No. No? Then uh, please thank uh, uh, Lydia for the uh, inspiring talk. <laughs> Hopefully there will be more. Inspiring. It's always my job to tell people it's more complicated than that. So it's not necessarily, <laughs> I don't know. I hope it made people think. Well, you, you see that uh, a lot of the science is pseudoscience. Yeah. Well, it, the thing is that it's real. It's just that we have to acknowledge that there are invisible biases and think that, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. One final. We have a little gift for you as well. Oh. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Oh, a tent. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The next session will start in 20 minutes.